When I started as a medical intuitive, um, which, which was years, years, years ago. <laughs> wow. You know, do you know what, how strange it is for me to see someone say, I've followed your work for 25 years. <laughs> what? What? I haven't been around that way, you little, get out of here. But anyway. Um, so when I started as a medical intuitive, the significance of doing something you never heard of. So you didn't have that myth, I'm following something extraordinary. In, in my case, what I learned from that part of my life is that I really did want to do something extraordinary. I wanted to be a great fiction author. And I, I sometimes joke about that, but I wasn't joking. And the thing is, I have no talent. The blessing in that is that all my fantasies went into something I have no talent for and I had no ambition to be something I have a genius for. Now the blessing in that is that I had no, there was no sense of am I the best, am I the competition, da 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 da, there was nothing. Number two is there was nobody else doing it. I recently had dinner with somebody, in some young whippersnapper, who's on his way into this field. And there I am sitting across from him, looking at his phone, and I was like, if you're having dinner with me, or are you having dinner with your phone, I'm going to give you one second to make that choice. Okay, so the phone went away. And that was smart. <laughs> okay. But as we got head into this discussion here, I I I said to you know, um, he said, "How did you become good at what you do?" And I I want to just hit a pause button here and say I don't normally talk about myself. This isn't about you learning about m me. It's a. I, I need to be very clear about that. I'm trying, I, my intent here is to share what struck me in my own journey as my moments of awe through my own life. And, and tragically, I have to tell my own life to get there. But these were my aha moments had have led me to where I believe is my most significant time. So can we, I, I need to be, how do I say, clear about that. I don't want to say, and then this, do, are we on the same page here? So I tell you this with my shoes off on sacred ground. So as I was talking to him, he said, how did you become good at what you do? And I said, well, I didn't have any interest in it. And then I was blessed to meet someone who did have interest in it, who was a neurosurgeon from Harvard. And because he had an interest in it, I then started to pay attention. But all the while I was a publisher, so I had a task, and I didn't have to earn a living doing this. So now that was very significant. So I never had to become competitive. I never had to work, like make money doing this. And then I lived in New Hampshire in a village of 800 people in a small little cabin that I couldn't even afford to heat, I will tell you. And then I moved to a farmhouse that I co-rented from a family I grew to love. And I, I lived on twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year for the next nine years. And I thought I was rich. I tell you, I thought I was rich. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I made friends in this beautiful little village. And all the while, I would, Norm and I began to do six to eight readings a day. My life was quiet. I had not. I did not have a television. I didn't have any technology. And thank you, God, the computer and Google and the internet had yet to be created. And I told him this. 
that I did not plug myself in in this obsession to myself. You plug yourself into yourself the moment you get up in the morning and you can't unplug. You are addicted to yourself and I never was. I never was. And you are. You can't, and you're addicted into, to what is everybody else doing and are they thinking of me? You're addicted to that. I said, I'm not an addict to that. And it never occurred to me. I became intrigued by what was going on in other people. Other people became my focus, not me. So from the get-go, my focus was you. You. And what was the cause, I mean, what was, what's going on here in you? Not how can you make me famous? It never occurred to me to become famous. And I said to him, that's all that's occurring to you. That's all. Your goal is to become famous. My goal was to become accurate. The very thought that I would hurt somebody or harm somebody scared the crap out of me. And I was so grateful that I had a physician who helped me hone this skill. And number two, that I had faith. That I had a sense of awe. I was, grew up in a mystical community of nuns and family. I never had to work to believe. And my personal spiritual life was so mystical from the get-go that I used to, when people would say, did you think there was something weird? So how many times somebody would say to me, I thought something, did you ever, something was weird with me or strange, you know, I thought, wow, because I thought I was intuitive and I thought you'll never be any good at this. You will never, ever be any good ever. Go peel potatoes. <laughs> In the language of Teresa of Avila, you will never be good, ever. You'll never be accurate. You'll never go do something of service that has nothing to do with training your intuitive system, your, the world behind your eye, because you have no idea what comes naturally to you. And you pay attention to what I just said right now. That's your first jewel. You have no idea what comes naturally. Clarity of soul comes naturally. It is not unnatural. You should not be surprised when you see clearly. How can that surprise you? That it surprises you is something you should shake yourself like a rag doll. It never surprised me. How could that? I used to wonder when I was young, how do you get through life not seeing clearly? How can you possibly make it through a day not hearing your angel? And then when I got older and I saw these people making things up, talking on stage, thinking that they could just call an angel to be a performer, I thought, you blasphemous fools. And you have all these people paying money, throwing money at them. I thought, you charlatans, you blasphemous fools. This is how desperate people are to come near the sacred, but not really. Not really. They're just going to a circus, paying money, so that they actually don't come near the sacred at all. It looks like sacred, smells like sacred, but it's not. Because if you really went near it, you'd take your shoes off on sacred ground, bow your heads, and actually know you're near something holy. Nobody, nobody who knows anything about the sacred would go near a sideshow. A sideshow? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's nothing but blasphemy.